Bom dia. It is so wonderful to be here in Brazil at last. When Singularity University was founded almost 10 years ago, there have been more Brazilians who have come to Silicon Valley to take programs with Singularity University than from any other country in the world. So it's wonderful that we can now bring Singularity University to you here in Sao Paulo. We're going to have an amazing two days together. Now, a colleague of mine reminded me that we need to tell you a little bit more about exponentials. Peter just talked to you about massive transformative projects, about uh, um, the abundant future that we're growing into, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about exponentials. But first, I want to welcome you into this future that we're in. Colleague, the same colleague reminded me that every day we wake up, we have a chance to start a new future together. And over these next two days, you're going to understand new mindsets. You're going to learn new frameworks. You're going to actually start to think about your future a little bit differently because we're going to give you the guardrails to build that from, which is the development of exponential technologies. Now, before we get into that future, I want to take a little bit of a step into the past. I have a job that allows me to go and experience Singularity University community all over the world. And last year, I went to our Singularity U Japan Summit. And when my friends found out, that I was going to Japan, they said, you have to go to the Tsukiji fish market. This is where they have these big bluefin tunas that are auctioned off every morning. The Japanese trawlers go out, and they fish them, and they bring them in. And early in the morning, they line them up, and the best specimens are auctioned off for the, for the highest possible price. Now, last year, one of these fish that weighed about 200 kil uh, kilograms went for $600,000 for one fish. You can imagine with these kinds of incentives, the fishermen are overfishing this population, and it's believed that the last bluefin tuna will be pulled out of the water in our lifetime. There's got to be a way that we can prevent this from happening. Luckily, we as a species are a very innovative species. Humankind has been innovating for a very long time, but for the first several thousand years since we established cities, this happened at a very slow pace. I mean, there weren't very many of us. We weren't talking a whole lot. We were focused on food, clean water, and what we needed to build our empires. But then something really fascinating happened. It was the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, the population exploded. People were living for a long time. What innovation needs, and people talking with each other, and ideas spreading, and things being tried out, it just exploded. We see this huge curve go up in innovation. This is something, this is the world we live in now. Innovations are happening constantly, and this is why Singularity University was formed. We're here to empower leaders like you to be inspired, to be educated in how to think about exponential technologies and apply them to the world's biggest problems so that we can create this abundant future that Peter talks about. Now, we have an impact mission. Like Peter said, if you're going to make a billion dollars, impact the lives of a billion people. We want to positively impact a billion people by using exponential growing technologies. And what are these technologies? It's things like nanotechnology. It's robotics. It's energy. It's nanotechnology. All of these can be used to solve the world's biggest problems. Now, exponential technologies, why do we think exponentially? Well, Peter talked a little bit about taking steps, but I'm going to take us through another thought experiment that'll help to illustrate what we mean when something changes exponentially. So, your boss comes to you, and she tells you that in one month, she wants you to bring in a million dollars. Now, I have two solutions for you. On the one hand, I'm going to give you a suitcase on day one that has a million dollars in it. I'll put it on your desk. You go on vacation for the rest of the month. This is a great deal, right? On the other hand, I have a magic suitcase. And this magic suitcase, every day you open it up, it doubles the amount of money that was in there the day before. So you could take a vacation for the month, deal is done, or let's take the magic suitcase. The first few days that you open that suitcase, not a lot is happening. A penny, two pennies, four pennies. But by the time you get to the middle of the month, you've only got $163. So that added to the $162 you've already taken out before in days 1 to 14. We're halfway through the month, and we're nowhere near to being close to a million dollars. But let's wait another 10 days. And in that extra 10 days, now we're out to $168,000 when we open it up. So now we're over a third of the way to the goal, but we've only got five days left. Can we do it? Well, of course we can, because it doubles the next day and the day after that. And sure enough, on day 27, we open it up, $671,000. We've got our million dollars plus. And we've still got three days to go. On day 30 of this month, when you open that suitcase, you've got over $5 million sitting in there. 
So now we have over $10 million that we've achieved with a magic suitcase in 30 days as versus the vacation and a million dollars with the other one. Now, let's say we're really nice and I'm going to let you keep the suitcase for another seven days. Guess what? We all become billionaires. 37 days of doubling, we go from one penny to over $1 billion. This is the power of exponentials. For that first part, we're really bad at being able to estimate what the early returns are going to be, and then we're really bad at estimating what the late returns are going to be. This is exponentials. Now, we have something like this happening right now, and this is in technology. So Gordon Moore noted Moore's Law, and Moore's Law is basically this magic suitcase, but it's on computer chips. The price performance of computers is doubling at a regular interval, and this is something that has happened for a very long time. Indeed, Ray Kurzweil, our co-founder, went and did a study, and he looked back to technology all the way to the beginning of the 20th century, and he saw that through all these different paradigms of technology, each of these has been doubling at a regular pace. This is a logarithmic scale, so it looks like a straight line instead of that really steep curve that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. But we see that even through world wars, through economic downturns, this Moore's Law holds true. And we're currently in the fifth paradigm of this with integrated circuits, and we're about to enter into the sixth, and a lot of people think that that sixth paradigm is going to be assisted by quantum computing. So, each time one of these, another one picks up the pace, and this is the law of accelerating returns. Now let's look back 50 years into the time of the transistor, and this is when NASA built a really huge computer, it was about the size of a car, and it cost $3.5 million to build that one computer that sent men, man to the moon and back again. Now right now, every single one of us is walking around with a computer in our pocket that's 120 million times faster than that one that was developed just 50 years ago. My kids are using these powerful computers to post to Pinterest and to watch cat videos. This is what we're doing with technology because it's so cheap and things have become so dematerialized. Now, Moore's Law tells us that computers are going to get faster and faster, but some really strange stuff is happening as we start to use, uh, as we start to use our computers in new and interesting ways. This law of accelerating returns, it changes things so that as computers start to work with each other in neural networks, like the neural network that developed this piece of art up here, this is completely developed by artificial intelligence. This is computers thinking what aesthetics is. Now, how does it feel to have AI that is driving this kind of beauty, but what if it's the same AI that's deciding whether you have a good enough credit score to get a mortgage to buy a home for your family? What if this kind of AI is used to determine that how you acted in your teens means that you're going to be a criminal when you grow up? Something that we need to be conscious of as we think about this future. So I'll go back to um, Elon Musk. And Elon Musk is thinking about, uh, is creating this thing called the Neuralink. And the Neuralink is actually a brain-computer interface. It's a chip that's implanted on your brain. And what that provides you to is instant access to all the information in the globe at the same time. So now we're all highly connected, and what happens when we, everybody has access to the same kind of information? How can we change the world in a positive way? Going back, this is an illustration of that magic suitcase that I was talking about. The people over here who took the million dollars in a vacation, that's that white line. They knew that they could hit the target, but our magic suitcase helped us go through those moments of disappointment when it was a few days in and we didn't even have 10 cents in our pocket. We got halfway through the month and we were barely into the hundreds, but by day 25, we got to that moment of disruption where people could see that this magic suitcase is going to do wonderful things. And then we got in the moments of amazement and chaos, which was when we actually got to the point of being billionaires together. It's not too hard to get forecasting wrong. Back in the 1980s, AT&T asked McKinsey if they could help them to decide how big would the market be for cellular phones. And McKinsey at the time, knowing everything they did about the industry, these things were really bulky, the data cost a whole lot to share, the battery life was really bad, the talk time didn't work very well. McKinsey said with all kinds of confidence that by the year 2000, there would be 900,000 of these in the entire planet. So they were wrong by just a little bit. Because this yellow curve then led to the notion that in 1999, over 900,000 new cell phone subscribers were happening every three days. It wasn't a total market of 900,000. This is what it was growing by every three days. Another example more recently, the Electronic Alliance made a prediction in 2015 
that for an electronic vehicle that could go 200 miles on a single charge, there would be a total of 1,000 of those in the market. And just a few months later, Tesla launched the Model 3, taking pre-orders. And in the first week, they had over 300,000 people who put $1,000 down on this car that could go 215 miles on a single charge. Again, we miss it. That white line makes us think that we know what the future is going to be. But this yellow line of disruption, um, that puts us in brand new places. So how can we get better at, uh, at approximating what this yellow line is going to look like? We can use a framework by Peter Diamandis that he calls the six Ds. So any digital technology is going to begin to follow this exponential curve and into our future. And I'll go through each one of these at a time. So we're going to look at digitization. As soon as you take something and you digitize it, then it can actually drop into this Moore's Law curve of, of power and computing and getting faster and faster all the time. We'll take a look at something, the genome project. We look at the cost of genome. Again, this is a logarithmic scale. And this cost of a genome uh, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, we'll put the Human Genome Project that did the first sequencing of a genome back in uh, the 90s. And it was $2.7 billion. And they didn't even do the whole thing. Now, I've taken Moore's Law, and I've drawn that line of what we can expect because of what we know about Moore's Law, what we expect the cost to go down. And it was looking that in 2015, we'd get to about a million dollars to be able to sequence a gene. But something really amazing happened. In 2008, we found a next generation sequencing that allowed us to do it in parallel. What used to take years now could take days, if not hours. And we see that it actually fell off of Moore's Law and got faster and faster. And so now, in 2015, Instead of a million dollars to sequence a genome, it's down to just a thousand. And do you think it stopped there? No. The expectation is that by 2020, you'll be able to sequence a genome for just a penny. Now, what happens when we're actually able to understand the code of life for just pennies? How can we apply that to making the world a more abundant place for us all? I'll look into the deceptive as that next piece, those first few days of opening that suitcase. Won't go too deep into this one, because this is that digital camera. The first one was 0.01 megapixels, weighed four pounds, cost $10,000, and now we're all carrying one around in our cell phone. Kodak didn't see this coming. Mm -hmm. Their white line was a world where everybody did film. They printed their film on paper, and we all shared photo albums physically. They just didn't see this coming. Then we move into disruptive. AR and VR have digitized experiences. So if you think about the operating room, you want your surgeon to practice and practice and practice to get really good at a, at a procedure before they ever touch a person. Well, AR is allowing these surgeons to be able to do that. And moreover, while the surgery is happening, then the AR helps the surgeon to do it himself, so he doesn't need a whole room full of people with him. It's fundamentally disrupting the health system. Now we move into the area of dematerialization. Anyone with as much gray hair as I have is able to recognize what's on this desk. And these are all a bunch of things that are dustables. We'd have to pick them up every once in a while and dust them off because they were physical objects. These have been dematerialized, and we carry them around in our phone every single day. Now we move into demonetization. So if they're dematerialized, then it's going to get a whole lot cheaper. Looking at the solar industry, we're able to look at how much it cost us to be able to harness the sunlight to be able to create a kilowatt hour. And we've seen these prices tremendously dive down to, in 2016, it was three cents. And Ramez Nam tomorrow afternoon is going to tell you what the new price point is for kilowatt hours from the sun. It's basically free. And what do we do when things are basically free? Well, looking at other things that have been demonetized, Airbnb now has more reservations every night than every single other hotel chain combined, and they don't have a single hotel room. Uber, what it's done to the taxi industry, and soon there won't be drivers in these cars anymore. Anytime they're able to demonetize a capital cost, those savings are passed on to us as the consumers. And then finally, we get into my favorite, which is the democratization. If it's dematerialized and it's basically free, everybody has access to it. What used to take nation states' budgets to be able to do something can now be done with individuals. This right here is the MinION. It's the first real-time processor of RNA and DNA. We can now sequence genomes by ourselves. We don't need to wait for a lab to do it for us. This is $1,000. It can happen now. It can happen out in the field. It can happen in a lab. It can even happen in space. 
but now we have the opportunity to do really interesting things because we can sequence things and we can synthesize genes. And that leads us to what is the future of food? So the future of food is really about cellular agriculture. Cellular agriculture is the marriage of biology and engineering. We know how to put the building blocks of life together. We can create new things. And this brings us back to the tuna. Ah, oh, my mouth waters every time I see this. It is such good food. It's great with omega-3s, with omega-6s. It tastes delicious. Well, you know what? There's a group in San Francisco called Finless Foods that is actually engineering bluefin tuna meat. In a lab, they're able to take fish cells and grow the muscle and the fat to make it so that they can actually create bluefin tuna that is just as good as the real thing in the lab. Their goal is to have the price point of doing this equal with what the price point is of real bluefin tuna. So in Japan right now, if it's $3,000 per kilogram, they think they can hit that by the end of 2019 with Finless Foods and not take another bluefin tuna out of the water. Now, another group has taken a more lighthearted approach to this, and they think, what happens if you actually bring cellular agriculture to you, to your home? You can actually have something that's on your kitchen counter, then in the morning you say, I feel like having dark chicken meat ready for dinner tonight. You plug it in, you go to work, you come home, and there it is. Think of the empowerment that that brings to you. If you're into foie gras, think of what it means to never have to harm a duck or a goose to actually grate foie gras that you can put on whatever you want. Now, Bistro in Vitro is actually creating a restaurant that will be all about this. All the food will be made, and I actually have a, a reservation there. You can see that it's going to be in 2029. I went and I chose my, my entree, I chose my starter, and I chose my dessert. And you can go on to the in a Bistro in Vitro site and make your own reservation. It's going to be about 10 years out, but I hope that you'll be able to enjoy me. Um, this is going to fundamentally change the way that the food industry happens. When we're at this, I hope that we can talk about being exponential leaders because every single one of you who's in this room today can be an exponential leader. There are four qualities that we look at and that we develop in those exponential leaders. And the first one is to be an innovator. You're going to be inspired by what you see over these next two days, and I encourage you to take it home with you to apply it to things that you're doing with your family, apply it to things that you're doing at work, but try, learn, and try again. Innovate, try new things. You have the capability to do this. Every day is a new future. The other thing you can need to be is a technologist. Don't stand on the sidelines watching as technology happens. Right over here, we have the experience arena where you can go in and experience VR. You can experience robots. You can look at drones. Actually use it, because when you use the technology, you look at things fundamentally differently than if you just stand on the side and watch somebody else with a mask on their face. The next thing is be a futurist. We're sharing with you the frameworks of what you can depend on being true in the future, and then you can build off of that. So build your future plans accordingly. And then finally, be a humanitarian. We know that we can use all these exponentials, exponential technologies to do good and to create this world that we want to live in. So how do you do that? Well, the news is, good news is you're not alone. We have over 160,000 people in our community, and as you see, many of them are here in Brazil. We're so thrilled about that, and here in the front row, I actually see that we had the very first winner from our very first Global Impact Challenge, Fabio Teixeira, that you'll hear from tomorrow. He came from Brazil, he went to our Global Solutions Program, and he's created a startup that he will tell you more about tomorrow. All kinds of wonderful things happen in Brazil, and I'm happy to say that we have seven different chapters that are here for the community to meet in. You can see the list of the names here. We have a picture from an event that happened a little bit earlier this year in Uberlandia. Go and meet the chapter. If you see your city's name here, go and meet up with the chapter. If your city's name isn't, then establish a new one. Go to su.org where you can find these folks. Su.org is also where you can download an application to start your own chapter. And I look forward to welcoming you to this positive future. Obrigado.